Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Thrive Masterclass. Today is Thursday, June 20th, and my name is Kathy Petchel. I am one of the staffing and operations consultants with Hinge Brokers, and I am so excited today that I've got a friend and special guest, Hani Wilchansky, with me, and we're going to do a deep dive into how to build your bench in your early childhood program, whether you're just starting out and we can give you some tips and some things we've all learned along the way that might save you a little bit of headaches or whether you're just already in implementation stage and starting to grow, we're happy to help you with anything to do with building your bench, which will help you with your roadmap to success. I thought I'd go over the agenda for a couple minutes first and we'll give you some news and announcements. We've got lots of things going on on Hinge Brokers right now. Uh, it is a crazy and busy time in our industry. It's an awesome time to be in early childhood education, especially in the leadership role because our world is getting so much smaller and there's so many opportunities to connect with other people and to make a difference in children's lives and, and also families' lives. So we'll give you some announcements. We'll dig into some content about how to grow your bench. I'll be sharing a little bit of content as will Hani. And then we'll give, we'll wrap up with some questions and answers and give you what's coming up next month. So in terms of news and announcements, we want to tell you where we're going to be and where you can find us. First thing, oh my gosh, this is going, going to be awesome. First of all, it's in Denver, Colorado. So who doesn't love that? It's in September, September 12th and 13th, which is a Thursday and a Friday. The, last year, our, our Thrive Workshop was in Boston and we did one day and had so much great feedback about it that we were... Uh, our arms are twisted to do another uh, an extra half a day. So the first day, which is a Thursday, we're digging deep into individual one-on-one -on -one meetings about individual schools, either their company as a whole or individual locations in terms of their financials. One-on-one uh, -on -one with our broker team or our consultant team, which will be awesome. And then the second day, great content, which I'll tell you in a minute. But uh, other big... Uh, Big uh, important point uh, to point out is we're at the Kimpton. We love our Kimpton hotels, they're awesome. There's only 30 slots left. We limit this conference to 100 slots. It sells out very quickly. We're a couple months out yet, and so there is still time to get your ticket, but I would get your ticket and go ahead and get your hotel set up. And we also structured it to be a Thursday, Friday, so you could spend the weekend in Denver, Colorado, or the, uh, the outlying areas. Uh, if you'd like, so extend maybe a four day weekend. I'm personally gonna bring several of my staff. It's an awesome time to just come together as a team and dig deep into something that you don't necessarily do every day. We don't really look at our numbers as owners and directors. We're really looking at program and children. So anyway, I highly recommend it. I'll be there. This is an awesome initiative that I want to talk about for a minute. We, uh, we at the Hinge team, uh, I, myself, Kathy Lagan, and one of the gals on our team, Ali, went to China recently, and all were presenters at the World Forum. It was in Macau, China, and we were lucky enough to be able to tour schools and meet owners and directors, and it's just an overall awesome experience to be part of the World Forum, and if you haven't, I highly recommend it. And two, two years, they do it every two years. Uh, the next one will be in Vancouver, Canada. And it's a group of early childhood educators that are so passionate and friendly and very open to sharing ideas. And so out of that came the idea of helping Kim Holcher, who's out of Virginia, she's out of uh, Richmond, Virginia, her, her brainchild was coming up with a passport program that had two components. The first one is helping American schools become credentialed and credentialing with cultural diversity and understanding the global importance of assisting children and their families in the new world where our world is so much smaller and cultural diversity, anti-bias, and we'd love to share a little bit more about that with you. The other piece is 
a teacher exchange program eventually, but initially there's an opportunity to send your teachers to China to teach for a year. It's called Teacher Passport, and that's another opportunity, and we'll be sharing the um, the email address in a minute about the teacher passport program, but I highly recommend it If you want more information or just to give Kim Holter a call, that would be awesome Oh in this picture that you're seeing Patty Fields after we went to the World Forum and visited several schools We went to the Patty Fields and um, the rice fields and it was just amazing We actually took that picture one of uh, one of the members of our team. It's absolutely stunning Also in news, our fabulous boss and president Kathy Lagan, there she is, has been asked to been asked to speak asked to speak asked to speak at a little round table. It's a, a big group in New York City, and we're super proud of her for being honored with at being asked to speak. And if you haven't met Kathy Lagan, well, you're missing out. I'm sorry to hear that. But you could come to any of our conferences or give her a call, email. She is very, very open to helping anyone. She, she's, she's awesome. Or if she can't help you or if she, uh, she's pretty busy, she'll put some of us in touch with you and we'll be happy to help. So this is Kathy Lagan and I'm coming, uh, substituting for her today. We're also very active in speaking at local groups next month. Molly from our team and I will be speaking in California at one of the sequel events. Here we are. Uh, you can't see very well, but we love to go to conferences and speak. At this particular event, we're speaking to directors, and it kind of ties into what we talk, we're talking to Hanya about today, which is how you work with directors, owners, and staff so that everyone's on the same page, has the same mission and passion. And so a lot of times, if you can get your directors out of the school to talk about work on the business, not in the business, or to talk about things that are stressing them out or, or that are perplexing, someone sitting right next to them has the answer to their question. Usually you just get such great content when you go to these small workshops. So we're really excited for Wednesday, July 31st in San Luis Obispo. We're going to dig into some of our content now about building your bench. And so essentially what we want to support you all on is how to grow your team for success. How exactly to build your bench and why would we be building our bench? There's three reasons to build our bench. We don't want to miss an opportunity. So when opportunity knocks, will you be ready? Will you be ready to improve? So for instance, improving might be adding an outdoor classroom. It might be having a master chef come to your school and doing in-house field trips instead of getting the kiddos on a school bus. You might be growing your staff in terms of lots of extra training and what are you doing to improve? So we want to build a bench. Maybe you want to hire someone that's the master chef to come in or a master gardener to implement your gardening as part of your outdoor classroom. That would be a good way to build a bench and add value to your program, which will differentiate you from your competition. We um, talk about USP's unique selling propositions almost every time we're at these director workshops and our master class trainings. And it has to do with What's your why? What, what is your passion? And also not just the owner or the directors, but the staff, the teachers. And so how can you improve? And how can you build your bench? Maybe you're interviewing someone and they have a particular passion. Uh, for instance, a couple years ago, I wanted to add gardens as part of our outdoor classroom. So I hired someone that had a master gardener passion. You can have summertime help with the Boy Scouts or the Eagle Scouts that could build things or your outdoor classroom. Again, just an example of building your bench so you can improve. Another reason to build your bench is that you want to be ready to buy a program. Maybe you're looking at the school down the street and you know maybe the owner's thinking about um, retiring and you've got an opportunity to buy. Well, of course, at Hinge Brokers, we could absolutely help you with that and I highly recommend that. But my point in this particular slide is that you wanna be ready. You don't wanna have a school down the street closing 
and kick yourself that you can't take up the opportunity because you just don't have the depth on your team. You just don't have the bench in place. So I recommend building your bench ahead of time. And then of course, if you're ready to sell, same thing, call us, but you want to look really good to a buyer. You want to not be the key person in your, in your business. You want to be able to turn over the business to some other entity, a group that's going to take your passion and all of your hard work over the years and make it even better and grow your program and support your teachers and, and just help in your community. So again, building your bench so you can sell. We've got a couple of ideas to help you out on building your bench. Of course, the first thing would be putting your people first. Of course, I say the little people first, always. We always wanna track everything back to what's best for children. Putting it in this particular instance, I'm talking about your grown up people though. You're wanting to evaluate strengths and identify challenges of your team, whether it's at a site location or just individually. Some of the things I like to use and I like to coach on would be strengths finder. That's a $19 test. It's online. It's, it's a timed test. It's kind of a Myers-Briggs type test where it will tease out each individual's top five strengths. And you can then just chart it and figure out who's got strengths on woo, for instance. Someone that has woo, which means winning others over, that's the person you want to have do all of your marketing and do your tours because they're going to have a very high conversion rate and success. Somebody that is very strategic, you want on your team one that ships are down or when you really can't figure out how to do a staffing schedule or what location to put your next school at. So Strengths Finder is something I highly recommend. I like to do career ladders, and a lot of people in, a, in the industry do career ladders. They may be called different things, but essentially you're regularly having one-on-one -on -one meetings where you're doing goal setting, and you're talking to staff about, what I usually say is, I'm so happy to have you here. My schools are called Bright Beginnings, and I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia. I'm so happy to have you at Bright Beginnings, and I want you to leave me whenever that is, whether it's at the end of the school year, whether it's five or 10 or 20 years from now, I wanna leave you better in terms of your professional development and, and even as a person and, and socially with friendships at work, I want you to leave better for having been at my school. So that would be a, a reason to do career ladders. The other thing I think a lot of owners shy away from, and I think Hani might talk about this later, is just being very transparent, having anonymous, open-ended surveys where the staff don't have to say their name so that they're very comfortable being transparent. I think sometimes staff think we're going to get mad at them or they're going to be looked upon negatively if they say something negative where if the intention is constructive criticism or helping others have buy-in, that's what we want. We're all different. We're hopefully hiring diverse people, not everyone that's exactly the same. So absolutely, I think open-ended surveys. The thing I think staff forget about or owners and directors forget to do is go ahead and ask your former staff. They have absolutely have no reason not to tell you. I like to do it on an exit interview, but sometimes face to face, they're a little bit less comfortable than just shooting them a survey monkey, which is very inexpensive. And there's a lot of bells and whistles on it where you can get some really good research and data to help you grow the school. After you do a, an open-ended survey with your staff, then you'll want to give the staff the feedback. Here's what you all said. I just did this right before the new year and uh, we, were, we were asking our staff about our benefits and pay and we are really teasing out what they valued most. What kind of benefits would you like to have? And you know, of course you're going to customize for individual differences. Maybe they need childcare and people that don't, you're gonna maybe do something different for them. But really again, customizing back to the theme of this slide, which is put people first. Targeted training is another really good way to put people first, whether you're sending them to conferences at this moment, I was talking to Hani before we started the webinar, and she said, where are you? What in the world is that background? And I said, oh my gosh, I'm at a mastermind group. I'm actually in Atlanta, Georgia right now, and I'm staying at a hotel, and I'm in the midst of a two-day, uh, it's just a brain dump. You get together with 20 or 30 other professionals. They end up being your closest friends, honestly, and you just share ideas. So again, putting people first, going to meetings, or having your directors or staff do targeted training. And then stay gift and benchmark bonuses. 
anytime you can appreciate your staff, not just on week of the young child or um, week of you know appreciating teachers, but regularly. I do that often with what are, um, what are the things they value most, dream manager, those sorts of uh, activities, which we don't have time to get into today. But if you look at some of our old webinars that are on our website, we dig deep into those. Actually, all of last year, all 12 months, we talked about staffing and everything, uh, all different ways that our clients and our friends are putting people first. Our tech is a little slow, sorry about that. Um, so finding out why people leave. I hate to start with something negative, but it, you know the reality is people will leave. And as much as they sign a contract, which is pretty much not binding, but they sign a contract and I have my staff do a commitment statement. I just have three lines on our, um, on our application. And after we've hired them, we ask them to write a commitment that we can publish for the parents and say, Miss, uh, Miss Amanda in the toddler room is committed and here's why, here's what she said. And putting things, putting it down in writing and then publishing it for parents really helps parents feel more comfortable with your staff. But why would people leave? They're moving, they're staying home with children, maybe they're not a good fit either, um, either with your philosophy, maybe you're a highly academic school and they wanna be play-based, maybe vice versa. Sometimes they're ill or physically can't keep up. There's a lot of burnout in our business. Once in a while, there's personality conflicts as much as we try to avoid that. Teachers are very passionate about how they handle little ones and sometimes those conflicts. Sometimes there's better pay or benefits elsewhere. Sometimes in the field, oftentimes not in the field. And then they're not either willing or able to do the job. Not willing to do the job is a little more worrisome to me. For instance, if they're hired as a baby teacher, they need to be willing to diaper or willing to communicate effectively with parents. Not able to do a job, perhaps they have an injury and they can no longer pick up children. All of those would be reasons why people leave. After you know the reasons, you're going to look over your turnover. And again, be brave and look at what the actual hard data, hard numbers are. And this is where Kathy Lagan's just a star. And I think if, um, when you attend our conferences or call us for consulting, we can really help you with this. The easy way to do this is looking at your W4s, at, or sorry, W2s at the end of the year, and just digging deep on how many W2s did you have versus how many positions, full-time positions you have, and just knowing those numbers you can divide it up by location. Oh, my location in a certain part of the city or town had more turnover than another location. Wonder why, let's talk about it. Those surveys that you're doing with staff can really help you with that. The age groups, sometimes there's a lot of turnover. Where, where would that be? Probably you're going to say toddlers or twos. They're a really tough age group. There's a lot of burnout. Very rarely do you have a lot of turnover in pre-K, for instance. That's, you know, everyone wants to teach pre-K. Um, and that's not totally true. We wouldn't have teachers in other age groups. But in general, um, tods and twos are a little bit more difficult. So you'd be what positions. Also look at the shifts. Maybe you can do something easy like, gosh, I could do four, four 10-hour days. The staff could still get 40 hours. And I can accommodate all those call-outs with four tens. Rather, and maybe they're off every Wednesday, maybe they're off every Thursday. So segmenting out your turnover and figuring out what's the issue. Are they calling and complaining that they just don't want to stay late in the day and can you accommodate or, or fix that? The number of years with you, typically if they're with you a long time, they're going to stay and they, they leave the company and they're not planning to leave. Then again, you could have the burnout factor. The number of years in the field, same thing. The burnout factor is huge. If we're not growing their careers and growing our bench, and Hani's going to get into a lot of great content in a few minutes about that. Educational level. I'm in a college town. I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia. And so we've got very highly educated staff. And I'm happy sometimes if they stay the whole school year. They're using us as a resume builder were growing their career and they're moving on to the public school or perhaps they're going back to get their graduate degree or even post-grad PhD type situation. 
age of staff definitely has to do with turnover. I'm not talking millennials today, but I am referring to millennials at this, uh, in this case. Um, millennials love to job hop, you could call it, but a nicer, maybe more authentic way would be they just want to try out a lot of things. The boomer parents, and I have two millennial children, have encouraged them to try different things, travel, try jobs, you can do anything. So a lot of times you're going to have turnover at that age group. Getting into a couple more deep, uh, easy ways to grow your bench. Add to your present team. You want to be uh, overhired, not overstaffed. So if you're overhired, you have the flexibility to put someone, maybe you hire two or three extra teachers that you just don't know exactly where you're going to put them, but you know you don't want them to go work at the school next door or down the street. You're going to try to find something for them, whether it's a substitute, maybe they can work on your outdoor classroom, they can work on your training or curriculum development. I find that the more you grow your bench, the less kind of drama you have at the schools and the, the more you're ready to grow when the time comes. Uh, testing and measuring. A couple of my friends in one of my mastermind groups tested and measured having a third administrator at the front desk. So there was a director, an assistant director, and a third person. And so she found that her enrollment boomed because the parents always had someone to talk to all the time. So of course, all three weren't there every day open to close, but she had three people that she trained and tested and measured. And sure enough, her numbers went up, which bottom line, no money, no mission is what we say at Hinge Brokers. If you're not full, then you're leaving money on the table that you could use for good for children. Um, and again, stay gifts and bonuses, career ladders we talked about. Where to find the staff? So I'm telling you to grow your bench. Well, how in the world am I going to do that? Kathy, don't you know we're in this hiring crisis in America? Oh my gosh, that's what I hear from everyone. We are definitely in some type of hiring crisis in America right now. We are, and this is not just our industry. Starbucks has trouble. I was talking to an owner a couple months ago. She was in the Philly area, which is city area, and an Amazon was coming down the street. And she was super stressed because she was paying her staff. It was a Montessori school in this case. She was paying her staff $14, $16 an hour. The school had been around forever, very well regarded. And she said, what in the world am I going to do? I'm losing my staff because Amazon is running ads on the radio and offering $22 to $25 an hour. And, you know, just picking up boxes or doing more menial work. So she's losing, and you know, sometimes staff, that's a big pay difference. So sometimes staff just move on just for that. So what is your strategy? I say cast a wide net and vet, vet, vet. So you're going to go to platforms like Indeed, Workable, Snag a Job, Glassdoor, Newton, uh, another, um, th there's so many wonderful ones and I'm happy for you to email me and I can give you some other, other ideas. But you wanna identify what personnel gaps you've got and be able to recruit and train across all of the platforms if necessary. But you're always wanting to, the minute you think you're fully staffed, you're not. That's when that you're going to get the resignation letter that someone's pregnant and staying home with baby or husband or wife just got another job and now they're moving on. You just, it's just, it's just the way it works. Same thing with enrollment, honestly. The minute you think you're completely full, you're not. Someone's moving. Someone's child keeps getting an ear infection and they're going to stay home with them. We just, we're always enrolling and we're always hiring. This is one of my favorite things I introduced at our last conference. So this is cool. Think about tidying up with Marie Kondo. So she did the, this is her book, uh, The Life-Changing Life Magic of Tidying Up. She also has a really cool Netflix documentary or um, series. And so essentially the idea, she started with how do you clean your closet? How do you clear clutter from your house? And she's, she's out of Japan and she's, she's very famous now. I suggested that we Marie Kondo our schools or Marie Kondo our staff. And so 
essentially what that means is take a really good look at your staff and see what do I need to change? How can I change up or tidy up my staff? So the six rules of, of tidying up, commit yourself to tidying up. So take that hard look and say, I need to maybe take a serious look at my team and see who's not in the right seat on the bus, who needs to be coached up or perhaps coached out, who needs just a little bit of spark or a little bit more energy and how can I, how can I figure that out? And some of the things I said on the earlier slides like the career ladders or one-on-one -on -one meetings are, are really good examples of how you can tidy up and individualize for each of your staff. The next thing you would do is imagine your ideal lifestyle. Well, that would be Marie Kondo's uh, example for your house or your closet. Well, your, you, your ideal lifestyle for your school would be, I've got all the staff in the right place, everyone's happy, everyone's getting along, there's uh, everyone is motivated and passionate. They're bringing their A game. They're not shy about sharing ideas or solving problems together. There's transparency. What does your ideal school look like? And then what's missing on your team that you can grow your school? I go back to the strengths finder or some type of personality assessment or test. There's a million that are, well, I don't know if there's a million. There's a lot that can really help you fine tune. And, and some of it is, People just talking about themselves. Everyone likes to do that. They like to say what their strengths are, what they really want to do. Finish discarding first. So that would be evaluating your staff, uh, pro professional development, or putting them on performance reviews. So figure out which staff maybe need to be coached out. Um, and tidy up by category, not by location. So maybe you're looking at all your infant units and saying, you know, how can we improve our infant unit? We're having turnover in the infant unit. So again, back to segmenting out from a couple slides ago. Now I'm saying, look at it, be brave, and figure out what kind of specific things you can do. Do they need more training? Do they need more one-on-one? -on -one? Do they just need a little bit more socialization or teaming? Do we need to go bowling one night or go to a fun movie and just everybody relax a little bit and get to know each other? And then follow the right order and ask yourself, does it spark joy? So if you're asking your classroom teachers, I actually did this with my staff, not tidying up my staff, but I said, let's tidy up our classrooms, put everything in the middle of the classroom and rebuild it again. So you don't have to just do this tidying up to be specific about your class, uh, about your team. So learn how to Marie Kondo your team. So again, moving up, commit to developing your team. Reassign, find a better placement, position, or schedule for them. Thank them and say goodbye with a grateful heart. It's really important when staff leave, and I, I don't know if Honey's gonna talk about that, but when someone leaves, it's really emotional for them. They, um, people like their habits, they don't like change. So either if you coach them out, they're gonna maybe have their feelings hurt, and you wanna be really careful not to do that, or maybe they're leaving and your feelings are hurt. Again, you wanna just kinda put your ego aside and be able to say, oh my gosh, thank you so much for everything you did. We really appreciate it. How can I help you in the future? Please don't be a stranger. Let me know how I can help. Um, maybe they left and they weren't willing and able, and, um, but you still want to thank them. Does your staff spark joy in each other, in families, in you? Um, we're at our workplaces and our schools more than we're with our families. And so having, Having the right staff and sort of that secret sauce is key. And I'm hoping Honey is going to take it from here and give us, uh, you know, dig deeper into some of these concepts and share some of her own. And Honey, I'm going to send it over to you. And if you could introduce yourself and give us yep. just a little bit about your yep. background. Thank yep. you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. So does anyone so else hear an echo? Do you hear an do you hear an echo? Oh, no, I don't hear the echo anymore. Okay, so Kathy, I'll just ask you to click stop share so that I could share my screen. Awesome, thank you, okay. So, hello everyone, I'm Khani Wolshansky. I'm really excited to be here with all of you today. Um, we're gonna 
take a little bit of a deeper dive into what Kathy had started. Um, so let me just click play here. Um, and just a quick little 30 second intro into who I am. So I started my journey a little over a decade ago and I taught toddlers for eight years. That was a big spark to my journey of what it takes to build and sustain excellence within a school and an organization. These are my kids. This picture was taken in February. So I have a little 18 month old, a four year old, a seven year old, and a nine year old. So we've got our own little preschool in our house also, in addition to working and coaching with leaders. So it's a tremendous honor to be here. And thank you, Kathy, um, for having me here. Now, what I want to dig in today is really give you very specific micro wins. It's a big part of what I believe directors and teachers need to build their own confidence, um, which is a big part of what it means to build your bench because on your bench, you want confident decision makers who will take your school to that next level, who will be those leaders. And more than anything, I find that owners are just struggling with, I wish she was more confident. I wish she took more ownership. I wish she just made the decision on her own. And today we're going to dig into why they are struggling so much with doing that. So in today's lesson, we're going to go over quickly of the top three things to focus on as an owner, as you're building your bench, how to create an environment of ownership. That's what you're looking for. You want people to be owners, um, thinking owners, right? You are the actual owner who controls the purse strings, who owns the deed of the building or whatever it is. You want people to be thinking as owners because that's the only way <clears throat> to truly scale and build other locations and move on from there. We'll talk about what the priority matrix is and then how to get yourself to higher level vision thinking. If you are always stuck in the minutia, you cannot grow your school because you will forever be tied to the day-to-day -day decision making as far as should we take the blue van or the green van? Should we order one ply toilet paper, or two ply toilet paper? Like if you need to make those decisions, you can't really grow the company. So real quickly, I just want to give you this background. We are going to, this, the overview that I'm giving you is the lens of thinking like an owner, but these are the three pillars that I created of how to build and sustain excellence. And every single school is constantly um, honing in on these pillars. Your daily operating principles, how you show up daily, your leadership operating principles, which are the stakeholders, yourself, the teachers, and the parents, and then your standard operating principles, right? How you show up um, in the way you operate your school, whether you're a specific school philosophy, Montessori, Reggio inspired, plea based, progressive, whatever it is, um, and in the way you communicate with your with your leaders. So today we're really going to be focusing on the leadership component, that one pillar of you, how you need to show up as a leader, because that creates the ripple effect to everybody else. So one of my favorite quotes that I want to get started with is from my business mentor, Todd Herman. You either run the day or the day runs you. And when the day runs you, the track rarely leads to growth. And so as you take a pause for a second right now, and I want you to think about, and is the comments open? Like, could people comment, Kathy? Um, Yes, but I can't see it at the moment. Well, hold on. Um, not at the moment. I'm just moment. curious because I, I like to see like what people are, are saying right now, if that's an option. If not, we can leave it as it is. But um, I'm curious to know when you think about this quote. Um, oh, yeah. it is in view. I see. Do you feel I like know. you're running the day or do you feel the day runs you? Which one? Just let us know quickly in the comments. I run the day. The day runs me. Let me know so we could just get a little bit of an overview of like, this is where I'm holding right now. Um, because when we know where we are, depends on the day. <laughs> when we know where we are right now, then we know the path that we're heading towards. Um, so thanks, Melissa, for sharing that. Awesome. Half and half. Yeah. So again, it's like, you know, super contingent in that way. but. Um, there we go. One second. Sorry, my slide deck. There we go. Okay. Day runs me. Yeah, the day runs me. Arlene, hi. Some days I can run the day. Most of the time the day runs me. Right. So let's talk about the three problems of why the day is running you or why it's half and half or why it depends on the day, right? One is we let the urgency of parents and teachers and our admin team warp our perception 
of what is truly important to the growth of the school. The parent thinks that their child's uh, toilet training issues are the most important thing in their life today. And in their life, it is. In your life, it's not. The teacher thinks that her, she needs to show you this gorgeous documentation board that she did. And that is the most important thing in her life today. In your life, it's not. And it's very challenging because as an owner, we want to be available. We want to be emotionally available. We want to show our people that we care, but we let the urgency of other people truly warp our perception of like, this is really not important. I could do this in an hour. This is truly important. Um, the second thing is we let the routines and habits of trivial work, scrolling Facebook, responding to emails, calling back people, that's trivial work, suck the value from our days. And so as an owner, you, your work is the most valuable work in the company because you get paid paid the most in the company. And so this isn't about a hierarchy of like, oh, I get paid more, so I shouldn't mop the floor. It's not about that. It's about when we do trivial work, it sucks the value from the day. And so the true value that brings value to the company's bottom line or makes it available to buy or sell or whatever it is, gets sucked because you're not doing work that adds value to the company. Um, and the last thing is we believe that our team cannot do it without us, without us. We truly believe that if we step out, the whole thing sinks. And it's scary to leave because we're afraid if we come back, we're coming back to nothing. And so my goal here today is to show you some very simple micro wins. I'm obsessed with simplicity. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci has a great quote. It's simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Simple, simple, simple. Please don't do complex things. Your brain is so busy and has to make so many decisions already. You don't need anything more complex. You need true, simple, effective steps. Okay. So why is it hard to hold people accountable, right? Let's dig into this piece because we own the decision making, right? We own every part of the decision. And so the moment we want to try to hold someone accountable, we can't because the decision making isn't in their power. It's in ours. So why do our directors defer from decision making, right? Because some, some owners will tell me, but, but I let them decide, but I want them. And I tell them, what are the options? You know, let me know. But they're always like, oh, I don't know. Or you decide, or I tried this, or I'm not sure. Right. And they kind of get a little insecure. One of the reasons that our directors defer decision-making, which makes it even more challenging to hold them accountable, is because of this. Decisions are more likely to be deferred when the choices have conflicting alternatives or large trade-offs. Most decisions that you want your directors to make can have some different alternatives. Well, if I go this way, then this will be the consequence. If I go this way, then this will be the ripple effect. Or if I do this, this is the trade-off. Or if we do this, this is the trade-off. A lot of mental thinking, a lot of decision-making, a lot of repercussions. Don't want to deal with that. Kathy, you take this. You're the owner. You, you deal with it, right? We, our directors don't want, one, they don't want the mental capacity because it's exhausting to make decisions. And two, they don't want the repercussions of the alternative or the trade-off. And so if you hold the decision-making, then you have to deal with the consequences. I was the only person who implemented what you said. Um, just give me an emoji or a thumbs up in the comments if you're following along with me so far and if like what I'm saying is resonating with whoever's here as an owner. Um, just real quickly here. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, Kira. Appreciate the quick response. So what's the problem as long as we own decision-making? One, growth is stunted and there's no exit. You cannot exit your company, sell, retire, go on vacation, get a manicure, go to the beach, do anything you want to do because growth is stunted because no one can do anything until you are there, right? Like every decision is yours. Problem number two, the transition when you sell or when you decide to step out is going to be a roller coaster ride and you will never get the highest value dollar for your center because the person who's buying is like, are you kidding me? You're sending me on like a seven loop roller coaster here. Like I, I didn't sign up for this. Um, so you're not going to get the highest value dollar um, when you truly decide to sell and you should do that through Hinge because they're awesome. Uh, problem number three is iceberg, icebergs aren't planned. Will they sink your ship? 
this is the most terrifying thing I hear from owners, right? No one plans to hit the iceberg. Titanic didn't plan to hit the iceberg, but it hit it and then it sunk. And we are terrified that if we leave and our people hit an iceberg, will they sink? Or will they know what to do if we are not there or not available in that moment? And it is, it's terrifying because the center is our blood, it's our sweat, it's our tears, it's our mortgage, it's our life investment, it's our life saving, it's our retirement, it's our life insurance policy, it's like everything, right? And it's like, they can't hit icebergs. Like, I'm gonna lose my entire life savings if they do this. Super terrifying. And so, you know, the high risk is the high reward. So let's take some baby steps in how we're gonna help our directors take more ownership, okay? If you make the decision, whatever happens is on you. Good or great, it's always on you. So that's why we need to help them defer that. So how do we guide decision making? Well, I love bowling. I got four little kids, we love bowling. And I think this analogy is so powerful. We need to add bumpers, right? So when you go bowling, and you throw the ball, the kid can never get into the gutter lane because he's got the bumpers, right? So no matter which way he throws the ball, he ain't scoring zero. And so as an owner, we need to set up some simple bumpers that act as this like steering lane that they're not gonna fall off the cliff if they make that decision, or they're not you know, sinking the Titanic or falling off Niagara Falls or whatever it is because the bumpers are there that the moment they hit it, it's like, oh, 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 got to get back here. Like, this is, this is where the ball needs to be right now. So what are bumpers, right? Because it's a great analogy, but let's try to figure out what those bumpers are. So here's an example, right? Let's say the AB school bumpers are, the purpose of these bumpers are to serve as guidelines for decision making, right? So this becomes your internal compass for how you make decisions, and so let's say, for example, the internal compass of the ABC school is one, keep your word, be part of the solution, and think through the outcome. So let's say the next time a director comes to you and she's like, hey, Kathy, um, you know, I'm not sure really what to do about the preschool graduation. We usually do it in the big auditorium. This year there's construction. Um, I was thinking to do it in the small one, but I don't know if there's going to be enough space and I don't really know what to do. Right. So now she's coming and she's like, you make the decision. You think through this whole process for me and then just tell me what I should do. Right. It's very easy to take action. Very hard to think. So instead of making the decision for her, have her work through the internal compass. Right. So you could tell her something like, okay, honey, like you coming to me with this problem. Sounds like there's a lot of different conflicting alternatives. Right. Let's use our guidelines here, right? One is you want to be part of the solution. So you want to be part of creating the solution for what we need here. Parents need a great place to show up for the graduation. That's the end goal. Think through the outcome. Now I want you to think through it. Take five minutes. I got the door. I got the phones. I got you back. Think. Come back to me in five minutes. The reason you're doing that, even though it takes longer in that moment, is if we don't help the person flex the prefrontal cortex of their brain and actually use their brain to think, they will never be able to think. So when we create this internal compass, we give them these guidelines, but we have to constantly model it at the same time. So here are four questions for you to get started with. You could write these down. I also have them in the uh, worksheet that I created for you guys, which you could get at Hani.me slash hinge, which we'll give you guys access to. Um, and these four questions are great to get started with. Okay. Director comes to you. I don't know what to do about this. Will you? We'll use the graduation example. Okay. You could respond, but where are we making the graduation? Which room is it happening here? Great. Next question. How do you propose we solve this challenge? Got a challenge. We usually do it here. Now we have to do it here. How do you think we should solve the challenge? Well, I think we should do blah, 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 blah. Okay. What do you need from me? Right. What do you need from me right now? Um, I need to know that um, it's, you know, going to be available that day and no other classrooms are going to use it. Great. Um, you know, ping Carrie on that because she knows all the room arrangements. And if she says it's open, then you got my clearance. Okay. So the reason we're doing this is because we're walking the person through a very powerful process to be able to think, um, to be able to think better. So that's your accountability. That's your micro win. So as soon as you get off the call today, I already know someone's coming to you and asking you to make a decision. Don't make the decision. 
use one of these questions to help them make the decision on their own. Okay. Um, so again, print out the questions, Connie.me slash hinge, choose one of your directors to work through this for three days and write out your bumpers. So if you have 20 directors, you don't do this with all 20, pick one, focus on her, see how you can get her. And if you know how to do it with one, you could do it with everyone, right? So let's create that win for you. Okay. Next step. Where do we begin? Data. Okay. So we need some more data from your staff. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we want to understand where is the biggest gap in the systems in the way that this company is being operated right now? Because we have all these people on our bench, we have all these different things that we want to get done, but where is the biggest gap? So here's another big win or a quick exercise for you guys to do. As people are asking you questions, I want you to try to write down and slow down. And I did this exercise um, last year at our event. Uh, last year, we had a couple of directors come back. A couple owners said that they did the exercise and they said it was really interesting to see that most of the questions, one person was related to school supplies. Where are the supplies in the building? And she said, I always thought we had a good school supply system, but apparently we didn't because I was keep getting bogged down by it. Um, and so they sat down and they created an effective system for ordering and maintaining the amount of supplies that were in the teacher's room or the supply closet. And she said, it was amazing. And then like the questions just disappeared, right? I said, great, but nature abhors a vacuum. So it's going to be filled with some new questions. It's going to be your next system you got to do. But right now we got rid of the issue with the school supply system. So your next action step, right? Your first one was about helping people solve problems. Your second one is get data. What are the questions your directors are bringing to you at all times? Because those are the ones that are trapping you in the minutia. They're trapping you from being able to leave. They're not allowing you to create an exit plan because they always bring this to you. So you That's the first system you need to create, right? Owners always tell me, I have to create systems for everything. No, you don't. You need to create systems for one thing, one at a time, and the thing that's needed most. Because if you need to create systems for everything, here's what happened. Holy crap, I don't know where to start. And you paralyze yourself, and then you don't do anything. You have to start. Nothing is going to be perfect. Take imperfect action every day and you will build an amazing bench and a school of excellence. But being paralyzed by the indecision of like, where do I start, creates such friction in your body and shoots your confidence. So of course you can't show up as the leader that you want because you're so insecure about where to begin. So we wanna build confidence by micro wins, right? So one thing, one time, super slow. So here's your action step, okay? Super simple. This is what I love. This is what, this is what I love technology. Okay. When you're doing something, okay. When you're doing like, let's say you, um, so here's a perfect example. We had a owner who said, Hey everyone, I'm not sure if you can hear me right now. Sounds like Hani just got frozen. Can anyone hear me? Yay, okay. So people can hear me. We're trying to get back with Hani. I think she's gonna probably have to go back, go out of Zoom and there she is. Hello. Sorry, I'm sorry ladies. Okay. Okay, we got you back. I'm sorry. Okay, so what happens is, is you record it on your phone and then you zip it off to your office assistant who now just has the system right on right in in the in the computer system or wherever you log your stuff because that becomes the most important system that you start capturing you don't need to hunt for systems anywhere outside of your school you have every system do you know where it is 
here. So you need to get it out of your head. And so as an owner, as you start coming up with things that are happening, this is what technology is for, to make our lives better. Open up your voice memo app, record it, and send it as an email to your assistant, your office team, your admin, and let them write down step-by-step step what you just said. Okay? Great. Um, so let's do this now. Let's go to our action step because I want to... I want to have time for the Q&A, right? So each member of the admin team and directors can capture one system this week, right? So it doesn't only have to be you. It could even be like your new office assistant who's like, I just thought of an amazing new way to order ink on autopilot so we never have to remember again how to order ink. Great. I want you to take your phone, record it quickly, and then send it off you know, to be transcribed. The goal of the system is that a 10 year old should be able to do it. If it's got like 17 billion steps and like different codes and all of that kind of stuff, that's not a system. Because then when you need a sell and new people come in, only you know the system. That doesn't work. You're not getting anything for that, right? Um, so that's how you create very, very powerful systems, okay? So just to summarize, you wanna download the action sheet, khani.me slash hinge. And bringing everything together here, I want you to just put into the comments section, um, we'll click stop share here, and we'll just look at the comments section. What is the one step that you are taking at 2 p.m. Eastern right after our call? Are you gonna decide to use the questions to hold your director accountable? Are you gonna capture a system? Are you gonna be more cognizant about how the day is operating you? Just let me know in the comments, and this is your accountability to everyone else on the call that this is what you're doing. Um, and while you're doing that, Kathy, I think we could just open up to Q&A. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can't hear you. Uh, if we could just advance to the next slide, I think the questions are coming up. And while we're doing that, honey, I love the imperfect action phrase. I think that's awesome. I mean, Take just imperfect do action every day. Don't be perfect. I love it. Yeah. Uh, looks like we've got a comment from Elke. Did you, can you see that? Um, have all our leads entered into our CRM system. I love that, right? So let me break this down even further, right? I want you to think about who's the person that is going to document how to enter one lead into the CRM system. That's it that that person needs to do because once they know how to do one lead, they can learn how to do other things as well. So thanks for sharing that. Perfect. Thanks, Elke. And I think the next slide, here's the first question. So here we go. You ready? Okay. Yeah. A uh, teacher has been in the director position for 10 years. How do you encourage and help him or her besides just sending them to conferences and encouraging formal education? What else do you do? So there's a number of different things that you could do. Um, I'm going to share two ideas, okay? The first thing is, is, in, I call it the invitation challenge, where human nature is we all need to be challenged and we all need to want, we all want growth, right? We all want to be challenged, we all want to grow. And some, somewhere along the way in our life, we have life situations, trauma, um, life experiences, just things happen to us and we lose course of the fact that we actually do want to become better people. We actually do want to grow. We actually do want to strive for excellence. And I think that's the job of amazing leaders where they remind people why they're here, why they're on this earth, why they're actually in this school to begin with. And I always recommend inviting people to a challenge. So I would say something like to the director, you know, you've been here for 10 years. These are some of the amazing ways you've added value to the company. You've done X, Y, and Z or whatever it is. And I know that you're someone that continues to add value and likes to push yourself. And so I wanted to invite you to try this new challenge. It's a three-day challenge, um, super short. I know there's a lot going on right now in the center, um, but I, I think you're ready for this. And I wanted to invite you to do X are you up for the challenge, right? Too many times we expect our directors to bite off more than they can chew. And so it's like, oh, I want you to take the seven week course. And she's thinking, are you nuts? I don't have time for that. Um, so a three day challenge boosts confidence very quickly because it's a micro win. And so when the three days are up, you loop back and you say something like, 
that was amazing. Like, I so appreciate you took on that challenge, like, um, you know, and just giving her some real concrete feedback. You're creating a feedback loop in her head. I like this stuff. What's next? It unplugs them from kind of being stuck and lets them see that you're noticing them and are vested in their growth, which I love. That's awesome. Yes. Second question. How do you recommend keeping parents in the know about building your bench as you grow your school and your school community? So when we think about keeping parents in the know, the first thing that we always want to be aware of is the type of parent demographic um, that we have in our child care center. Because not every single parent demographic likes to know about every single thing that's going on. And some people like to know a lot, some people like to know a little. And so the first thing is you need to ask yourself, okay, do the parents in my community like to be informed about things that are going on or exciting new projects that are happening? If the answer is yes, then you move on to the next question. What is the method of communication that we typically use with our families? Do we update them through our Facebook channel, through our email channel, through our messenger board, whatever channel you use? There's like 7 billion ways to communicate with parents now. So what's your one method that you communicate with parents? And the next thing you want to get clear of is what is the purpose of us sharing this information? So I'm going to just share like a quick story personally so you understand why it's so important to ask that question. When you come home at the end of a long day or your spouse comes home at the end of a long day, sometimes we want to share about our day, right? We want to say like, oh, I had a really hard conversation with this or I spoke to this client or this happened or this happened, right? And it's just the purpose of like sharing because they're our spouse and we just want to share with them about our day. But some things that we share are not meant for that specific moment because the purpose of, sh of us sharing that is really just about us dumping that emotion right now on the other person. And our spouses and our directors and our parents are not there to be a container for our emotions and our insecurities. That is our job. We can hire coaches and trainers and people to hold that space for us in our community. Our people in our lives are not there to be that container. And so before you decide what to share, you need to ask yourself, the outcome goal of me sharing this information is to demonstrate to the parents that we are a school of excellence and that we're constantly growing and striving to bring the best people into our world, right? If that's the reason, you share by all means. But if there's other reasons that involve, just ask yourself you know, that question. Um, so I hope that's helpful as like a filter of like what to decide what to share. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, we, that, so this question was answered already. And do we have any questions from the audience that- Yeah, I can can you say, please, I would love any, any questions. So let's see here. We have Kira says, I'm holding people accountable. How do you propose we solve this challenge? What do you need from me? Amazing. Um, ask a director, I'm going to start using the questions with myself. Um, awesome. And, and I think the other piece is also coming from a genuine place of truly wanting to build that person's capacity for thinking and not about, I just need you to start making decisions and stop putting this, all this, you know, stuff on me. Because if you're coming from that place, the resistance is going to be tremendous. Do we have any other questions there? I think they're probably still coming in, okay. but um, I think we're at the we're two at the minute mark. Here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, do you have one more? Um, how do we get staff to think globally instead of about their classes only? Um, tell me what you mean by globally. Um, you mean like care about everybody else? Like, what do you mean by globally? I'm thinking it might be the whole school instead of just his or her classroom. Yeah. Um, so whenever we ask the question in a way of the bigger picture, everyone else. Okay. When we, okay, let me backtrack all the way. The quality of our questions determine the quality of our answers. And so when we ask questions like, how do I get someone to do something we've already lost because we cannot control other people's behavior. We can only control how we show up to that behavior. So the way we want to phrase the question is more about how do I create an environment that fosters collaboration and creative thinking? 
Because now when I'm asking it that way, now I actually have a way to design that, right? So good. I'm glad you found that good, right? So I, I, I wouldn't even answer the question right now because I actually think you know the answer. I want you to think about it from this angle. How can I design an environment that fosters collaboration and creative thinking? And then just to take it from there is also when you're met with a problem, think about another way to ask the question. Because if you ask it differently, you will find the answer. So I think that's a, a great way to end off. Make sure you download the worksheet. I have other great stuff over there also. And thank you, Kathy, uh, for allowing me to come on here and share some of the stuff that I'm super passionate about and excited about. So thank you. Yeah, honey, thank you. This was amazing. And just to back your very last point, if you think about how you do it in the classroom, we're asking the children questions in different ways. And we just wanna remember that all of our adults in our buildings have different learning styles and auditory processing, um, short-term memory or long-term memory. <laughs> and so customizing, just like we do with the kids, um, I, I find helpful. Um, last thing I just wanted to say besides thank you all for coming to our uh, webinar today is that mark your calendar for July, uh, July 18th at 1 p.m. where we'll be talking about the buying and selling process. Uh, it's a several part series and this will be part one presented which is uh, digging deep our whole year we're talking about succession planning and, and how you can be ready to grow or buy or sell when opportunity knocks. So uh, mark your calendar for July 18th and uh, we're always happy to answer questions after our webinars. If you shoot the questions to us or even in the um, chat box right now, either Hani or I will get back yeah, to you. Absolutely. We're happy to collaborate and thank you so much everyone especially to you honey for your time and energy and expertise absolutely and i'll definitely share the slide deck and everything and all of that i know a lot of people asked about that so absolutely all the resources will be available for everyone thank you everyone wishing everyone a great day and go do your challenge all right take care